Queen Consort, the Prince and Princess of Wales, and other members of the Royal Family. My late Lord Mayor, Your Grace, my Lord Chancellor, Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, Lord Speaker, Your Excellencies, my Lords, Aldermen, Sheriffs, Chief Commoner, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. And on behalf of my co-hosts, the two sheriffs tonight, Alistair King and Andrew Marsden, May I wish you all a very warm welcome to Guildhall for this Lord Mayor's Banquet. <laughs> Prime Minister, Your Grace, Lord Chancellor, Chancellor of the Exchequer, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. I am immensely proud to stand here as the 694th Lord Mayor of the City of London. Proud, that is, of the City of London, where I have worked for over 40 years, but deeply humbled as your Lord Mayor. But first, let me pay tribute to the 693rd Lord Mayor, Vincent Keaveney, the first Irish citizen to be Lord Mayor, and I'm delighted to be continuing the trend. It's a bit like Dublin buses. You wait 100 years for an Irish Lord Mayor, then two come along, one after the other. Yours was a truly historic mayoralty, Vincent, with the celebration, our first and probably our last Platinum Jubilee, and then, of course, the death of Her Majesty the Queen, and the accession of His Majesty the King. Through all this, you were a great representative of the city. All these events reminded us not only of Her Majesty's close bonds with the city, but of the importance of our constitutional monarchy for our stability and our continuity as a nation. My late Lord Mayor, you devoted your mayoralty to people and purpose, making sure the city provides opportunities to all people across the UK, and ensuring that the city uses its financial firepower for positive social purpose, which you did with your finance for Impact Summit. At the local level, both you and Amanda highlighted the scourges of hom homelessness and hunger in our capital. In this way, you demonstrated the unspoken work of the city, that societal aspect that does not fit neatly with the hackneyed stereotype 
of a selfish city. It is something that Felicity and I will also vigorously pursue, promoting not only a resilient and resourceful city, but a responsible city too. Building on the theme of my Lord Mayor's show two weeks ago, children, charity and community, which involved a record number of young people from diverse backgrounds, in many cases experiencing the City of London for the first time. As the cost of living crisis looms, we now have to show how our financial purpose can meet society's needs. As William Wright from New Financial puts it, the banking, finance and capital markets industry touches virtually every aspect of millions of people's daily lives. It directs capital into the real economy to help companies raise money, to invest in jobs, innovation, infrastructure, growth and prosperity in every corner of the United Kingdom. The industry helps millions of individuals across the country to save and invest for the future and for their retirement. By investing in these and other assets, they are creating a virtuous circle of investment and growth. And the insurance industry protects millions of people's lives, homes, health, cars, and so much else, underwriting risks and enabling trade and the transportation of goods. But now, our financial services industry must find ways to help people bridge this crisis by providing affordable credit, debt repayment deferrals, premium waivers on insurance policies, and so much more. I will convene a financial inclusion summit urgently to identify best practice with the FCA and develop a coordinated plan to see how the city can play its part in tackling this looming societal challenge. At the same time, however, we have to tackle the other great challenge. How we set about financing our future. As a prelude to us being able to tackle that, stability is required. And I applaud the way that the Chancellor and the Bank of England moved swiftly to calm guilt markets after the crisis of confidence triggered by the mini-budget in September. Nevertheless, the kindness of strangers that Mark Carney described has its limits. At the CBI last week, Prime Minister, you spoke about wanting to be bold, decisive and radical, and emphasized innovation and growth as well as green and sustainable finance. Keir Starmer spoke about his growth plans too and called for governments, business and trade unions to work together for growth that puts the interests of working people first. This confluence of thinking is timely and we must indeed work together to formulate medium-term plans so that we can deliver consistently and without deviation an economy that benefits the whole nation. And regulators must be part of that thinking too because regulation has been a barrier to growth, especially in the area of unleashing capital in our pensions, life insurance, and personal savings sectors. If we are too risk averse, then we put ourselves at a competitive disadvantage. That has to change. It has to change now, while the Financial Services and Markets Bill is being debated, because that must enshrine the way forward. I know that this is well understood by Sam Woods at the PRA and Nicola Ratti at the FCA, even if they have to look at it through a different lens. I'm delighted they're both here tonight, and I thank them for all that they do 
for a strong, independent regulatory system is a key foundation stone of a leading global financial center. Prime Minister, I was in Northern Ireland with our policy chairman, Chris Hayward, last week, talking to exciting tech and green tech businesses uh, and, the British, uh, and the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. And I will be in Cardiff later this week. Our islands are bursting with enterprise and creativity. But growth economy companies have become reliant on investment from sophisticated overseas investors, mostly North American, that look hungrily at the UK's startups and scale-ups. And that's because we have so much going for us. We have seven of the top 20 universities in the world, the biggest number of fintech companies and unicorns in Europe by far. Phenomenal talent, both homespun and entrepreneurs attracted by our unique offering from all over the world. So we need to send them a clear message that we are serious about supporting them by accelerating the regulatory reform set out in the Hill, Khalifa and Austin reviews, by removing the structural obstacles to growth in our high potential sectors like fintech and life sciences. And most importantly, by providing the accelerator capital for these companies and their talented entrepreneurs at each stage of their journey so they can start, scale, and stay here in the UK. Now, the reforms announced to the Solvency II regime are a very welcome step in the right direction and will make the funding of long-dated infrastructure loans by insurance companies easier and these plans must be successfully implemented. I believe we need a private sector UK growth fund of at least £50 billion to invest in long-term asset classes, in infrastructure, in property and in private equity, supporting the growth economy, green technology and renewables. We have the second largest pension savings pot in the world after the United States. But only 7% of pension assets are invested in these real economy asset classes. That is in contrast to an average of 19% for the economies with the other largest pension pots globally. If that moved from just 7% up to 10%, it would unleash 40 billion pounds. That would be a good start. Prime Minister, COP27 has reminded us all how urgent investment in renewable energy is for all of us. Otherwise, there won't be a future to finance. And that is why the City of London has committed to hosting the Net Zero Delivery Summit next May with the COP Egyptian presidency, with a clear aim of measuring delivery against the promises made with GFANS at COP26 and looking ahead to COP28. With a private sector UK growth fund into which everyone's defined contribution pension invests a small percentage of their savings that is capable of allocating capital to renewable energy opportunities. We can secure people's long-term environment, uh, environmental and financial health, giving everyone a stake in our future wealth and success, financing our future by helping people finance their own futures. Prime Minister, the city stands ready to play its part. This ecosystem of financial and professional services companies that coexist symbiotically in such a close geographic area 
a robust regulatory regime, underpinned by our world-leading legal services, our independent judiciary, and the primacy of the rule of law, is not mirrored anywhere else in the world. That is what makes the city of London such an extraordinary place to do business. And, ladies and gentlemen, that is why we now have a huge opportunity and indeed a responsibility to be the engine driving the economy forward by financing our future. I look forward to working with you all over the year ahead for a resilient, resourceful and responsible city supporting the whole United Kingdom. So now can I ask, please, government ministers to remain seated and everyone else to please rise if you're able and join me in the toast. His Majesty's Ministers. His Majesty's Ministers. His Majesty's ministers. Thank you very much. Silence for the Prime Minister. My Lord Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, whether by virtue of history or accident of geography, our country has always looked out to the world. I was born in Southampton a port city the Victorians called the gateway to the world, where the Mayflower set sail, where Spitfires were built and Allied troops embarked on D-Day. And just as we look out to the world, so the world often looks to Britain. Like many others, my grandparents came to the UK via East Africa and the Indian subcontinent and made their lives here. In recent years, we've welcomed thousands of people from Hong Kong, Afghanistan, and Ukraine. We're a country that stands up for our values, that defends democracy by actions, not just words. A country that commits not just our resources, but our ingenuity to better the lives of others and ourselves. Ukrainian flags have flown over almost every town and city on these islands for the past nine months. No one told people to put them there. They felt moved to show solidarity with people they've never met in a country most have never even visited, to show their faith in fairness, freedom, and the rule of law. These values are constant. They are set in stone. But as the world evolves, so does our application of those values. As Edmund Burke argued, circumstances and context are everything. And today, the pace of geopolitical change is intensifying. Our adversaries and competitors plan for the long term. 
After years of pushing at the boundaries, Russia is challenging the fundamental principles of the UN Charter. China is conspicuously competing for global influence using all the levers of state power. Now, in the face of these challenges, short-termism or wishful thinking will not suffice. We can't depend on Cold War arguments or approaches or mere sentimentality about our past. So we will make an evolutionary leap in our approach. This means being stronger in defending our values and the openness on which our prosperity depends. It means delivering a stronger economy at home as the foundation of our strength abroad. And it means standing up to our competitors, not with grand rhetoric, but with robust pragmatism. Now, we will do all this not only through our diplomatic expertise, science and technology leadership, and investment in defense and security, but by dramatically increasing the quality and depth of our partnerships with like-minded allies around the world. We will set out more detail in the updated integrated review in the new year, including how we'll work with friends in the Commonwealth, the US, the Gulf states, Israel and others. But tonight, I'd like to describe how we're already making this evolutionary leap in three other places. First, as we stand by Ukraine, we're also reinvigorating our European relationships to tackle challenges like security and illegal migration. Second, we're taking a longer term view on China, strengthening our resilience and protecting our economic security. And third, we're seizing the huge opportunities on offer in the Indo-Pacific by building deep and long-lasting partnerships. First, Ukraine. In Kyiv, I just saw how Russia's focus is shifting from bruising encounters on the battlefield to brutalizing the civilian population. It was written in the scarred buildings and the piles of rubble lining the streets. In the stories of the first responders I met, from liberated Kherson, from the torture chambers, to the booby traps left in children's toys. As the world comes together to watch the World Cup, I saw how an explosive device had been hidden inside a child's football, seeking to make it a weapon of war. It defies belief. So <laughs> Next year, we will maintain or even increase our military aid and we will provide new support for air defense to protect the Ukrainian people and the critical infrastructure they rely on. By protecting Ukraine, we protect ourselves. With the fall of Kabul, the pandemic, the economic strife, some said the West was weak. In fact, our response in Ukraine has shown the depth of our collective resolve. Sweden and Finland are joining NATO. Germany is increasing its defense spending. Partners as far afield as Australia, Japan, and South Korea are standing with us. We've developed an entirely new sanctions model. And through NATO and the Joint Expeditionary Force, we're guarding against further Russian aggression, whether in the East or the High North. We're also evolving our wider post-Brexit relations with Europe, including bilaterally and engaging with the new European political community. But this is not about greater alignment. Under my leadership, we'll never align with EU law. Instead, we'll foster respectful, mature relationships with our European neighbours on shared issues like energy and illegal migration. 
to strengthen our collective resilience against strategic vulnerabilities. And that brings me to my second point. We also need to evolve our approach to China. Now let's be clear, the so-called golden era is over, along with the naive idea that trade would automatically lead to social and political reform. But nor should we rely on simplistic Cold War rhetoric. We recognize China poses a systemic challenge to our values and interests, a challenge that grows more acute as it moves towards even greater authoritarianism. Instead of listening to their people's protests, the Chinese government has chosen to crack down further, including by assaulting a BBC journalist. The media and our parliamentarians must be able to highlight these issues without sanction, including calling out abuses in Xinjiang and the curtailment of freedom in Hong Kong. Now, of course, we cannot simply ignore China's significance in world affairs to global economic stability or issues like climate change. The US, Canada, Australia, Japan, and many others understand this too. So together, we'll manage this sharpening competition, including with diplomacy and engagement. And much of this is about dramatically improving our resilience, particularly our economic security. That's why we created new powers under the National Security and Investment Act. It's why we, use, why we use them this month to block the sale of Newport Wafer Fab. It's why we took action on 5G. And it's why we're ending global dependence on authoritarian regimes, starting with Russian gas. Now, we're also acting to deepen our ties in the Indo-Pacific. The third example of where we're evolving our approach. Before I came into politics, like many of you, I invested in businesses around the world. And the opportunity in the Indo-Pacific is compelling. Take Indonesia, which I visited just this month. It's a young, vibrant country, the world's third largest democracy, poised to become a top five global economy. By 2050, the Indo-Pacific will deliver over half of global growth, compared with just a quarter from Europe and North America combined. That's why we're joining the Trans-Pacific Trade Deal, the CPTPP, delivering a new FTA with India and pursuing one with Indonesia. But in the Indo-Pacific, economics and security are indivisible. 60% of global trade passes through regional shipping routes, including choke points like the Straits of Malacca. It's in our interest to keep these trade lines open. That's why we joined the five power defense arrangements with Australia, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Singapore half a century ago. And it's why we're evolving new long-term defense, industrial, and technological partnerships like AUKUS, with Australia and the US, and the future combat air system with Italy and Japan. By deepening these ties, we'll help protect the arteries and ventricles of the global economy, supporting security and prosperity, both at home in our European neighborhood and in the Indo-Pacific. My Lord Mayor, as we meet here tonight, the people of Ukraine are hunkered down in freezing temperatures on the front line of the fight for freedom. In Iran, women are displaying the most humbling and breathtaking courage, refusing to bow to thuggish theocratic control. And tomorrow, Iran's football team 
will again stand with them in solidarity, facing unknown consequences as a result. Freedom and openness have always been the most powerful forces for progress, but they have never been achieved by standing still. As Henry Kissinger wrote, during periods of crisis, whether war, technological change, or economic dislocation, management of the status quo may be the riskiest choice of all. Under my leadership, we won't choose the status quo. We will do things differently. We will evolve, anchored always by our enduring belief in freedom, openness, and the rule of law, and confident that in this moment of challenge and competition, our interests will be protected and our values will always prevail. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, your next course will now be served.